Let me just introduce you to Russell Stannard in case you don't know him already. So he's a Nile associate trainer and he's joining us from the UK today. He's going to um, give a little bit of ex explanation on how to move your teaching online. And then we're gonna do a little Q&A with all of your questions. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. I will make notes of them and then I will ask them to Russell. So over to you, Russell. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Right, lovely. Okay, so actually this is the second time I'm doing this uh, this, this talk. Um, have we got my talk on the screen, Fe Federica? I think we haven't. We got, are we gonna, or shall I do that? Oh, lovely, you're gonna do it, yeah? Brilliant, okay, yeah, lovely. Hi, hi everyone, incredible to see so many of you uh, online from all over the world, absolutely amazing. It's uh, There's nearly 550 of you already in the room. Um, just in case you don't know who I am, um, I'm, I run a website called teachertrainingvideos.com. It helps teachers to, to incorporate technology into their teaching and learning. It's very popular, it's really popular at the moment. It's getting almost 3,000 visits a day to the website. And the YouTube channel that's connected to my website is getting about 60,000 thousand visits every two days so the statistics for today in the last 48 hours are 60,000 visits it's so busy that I've employed someone to help me to deal with all the questions I'm really doing my best to try and help by answering all the questions so I've got a specialist to work alongside me and he's answering something like a hundred questions a day on the YouTube channel and then I'm trying to deal with all of the questions on the on the website so hopefully um, we can keep up with uh, with the incredible amount of interest there is in teaching in line teaching online so what I'm gonna do just to start with because obviously this is a Q&A and I'm really gonna try my best to answer as many of your questions as possible I'm not gonna know all the answers but I'll try where I can uh, we will be recording this session as well but this is a QA, and a and because I do have so much contact with schools and universities and teachers and because so many teachers contact me, I just thought I'd just talk about a few kind of issues that are in the sky at the moment where we are and uh, it might and also show you a couple of things that you might want to think about. I did it this morning and people really liked it so you know this this whole situation has been going on for about three to four weeks depending on where you are um, here in Britain it's been more like two weeks lots and lots of schools around the world literally all over the world are moving to teaching online for many many teachers that's the first time they've ever done that uh, I is what uh, you know had had a lot of experience teaching online before this, but I've never experienced and seen so many teachers working online before uh, in so many different situations uh, and situations that I'm not familiar with, as well as ones that I am fam familiar with. So it is a remarkable time at the moment. Um, I just want to talk. A about some of the issues and I'm going to quickly go through them and then some of them I'm going to go into more detail. First of all, a lot of you are teaching with a virtual learning environment, a virtual learning classroom. We, we call a virtual learning classroom, this is a virtual learning classroom, a webinar tool, a virtual learning classroom. Many of you are struggling with these virtual learning classrooms and they are tricky. So even for someone like me who uses a lot of educational technology, Virtual learning classrooms are not that easy to use. And I'm gonna explain a few reasons why. I think it will help you to understand. Um, and you know that is something that, that people are going through at the moment. And I'm gonna give you loads of support today. I've got lots of videos that I can show to you that will help you with breakout rooms and how to share the screen and how all the settings, particularly with Zoom, I've got one video on Zoom, for example, that's been played nearly a quarter of a million times already. So I'm gonna talk about that a big issue at the moment is security. People are starting to worry about can people come into these Zoom rooms? And in fact, my next video about Zoom is gonna be on security. One of the big, big issues that's coming out at the moment is about the lessons being very teacher-centered. And teachers are really struggling with how do you make a Zoom lesson it doesn't have to be Zoom, it could be Adobe Connect, it could be Click Meeting, this technology, it could be Go to My Meeting, it could be WebEx, there are many of them. But the live part of the lesson, how can we make that more student centered? I'm going to show you a couple of ideas and tr try to get you thinking about how you can do that. 
One of the big issues that everyone's talking about is now the need to make and help the students to become more autonomous. Because really, we've got to think about what are they going to do when we don't do the live class. At the moment, there's massive interest in the live lesson because we've all been asked to teach with Zoom or with, with one of these virtual classrooms. And suddenly, that's where all the interest is. But very quickly, hopefully, people will start to realize, OK, that's just one part of it. But what can we do? when after the lesson or before the lesson? How can we connect what the students are doing at home with what they do when they come into a class with us? We need to rethink that and that's going to mean that we are going to have to help our students to become more autonomous and to be aware of a few technologies that can help us to do that. So that's a big, big uh, point. One of the really interesting comments that we're getting a lot at, at university level, OK, so I'm doing different work with universities, is that this actually is a bit slightly dismissing this idea that you know, students are digital natives because a lot of them are actually struggling to work with virtual classrooms. It's always something that I felt. So in other words, I think that students are very good at doing certain things with te technology, but they're not ne necessarily naturally really good at working with these technologies in education. And I think they're also finding it a, a, uh, a challenge. I've never liked personally, I've never liked this idea that old oh, students can just use technology so easily. I don't think that's always true. And uh, my experience with these, uh, because, because I'm watching many classes is that it's not always the case at all. One really important point that's coming out that I've really been talking a lot about this week is because we're talking about these two different parts of the teaching, the live lesson, and then what the students do to do afterwards. In the past, most of us have not made use of the platforms that the publishing companies offer. All of the publishing companies have platforms that go with their books. And I think now is the moment when those platforms might become really important, because if we learn that platform, that can be the other part of the lesson. The students go onto the platform, they do their homework, they do their activities. Uh, we can track that. We can see what they've done. We can see what they've completed. We can decide what we want them to do. So that might be a really important now for us as students teachers to learn to find out about the platform that goes with the book that we use. I know, for example, that Macmillan have a platform that supports their materials. OK, um, having a vision of online learning as well. That's a really big discussion at the moment because everyone is so worried about the online part, the virtual part, the actual teaching in the classroom. And people are, are not thinking enough about it, how it all connects together. So we've got to try and build a vision. And part of that vision is to try to take pressure off us as teachers. Are there techniques and ideas that we can use that can help us a little bit to not always be the ones doing the teaching like I'm doing now? But this is a webinar. Can we take away and get you or get the students to do more of the work? Work, OK, I'll talk a little bit about technological choices and try to help you out a little bit there. And then just to say one thing where a lot of the discussion is going to be coming in the next two or three weeks is about assessment. That will be what, what's next on the agenda in a way, because I think that we'll all be thinking soon about, well, how are we going to assess our students? Um, and I know that, you know, many, for, for example, universities are thinking that this, this, this could be quite a prolonged period. Um, so I'm going to try and talk about a couple of those those points that I, I've just raised. And I want to start with the first one and try to help you a little bit. The, there are many of these platforms for teaching online, like Zoom, Click Meeting, Adobe Connect, Go to my meeting, Wimba, there are many of them. I've been working with them for many years. My favorite one actually is Adobe Connect, but it's quite expensive. I like this one that we're using today. It's called Click Meeting. But of course, most people have gone for Zoom. What you need to understand sometimes is take a step back and think to yourself, what is the center? How is this system organized? And when we work with Zoom, everything is about screen sharing. OK, so I'm going to give you some videos at the end that are going to show you how to understand and learn Zoom. But mainly when you work with Zoom, it's about screen sharing. So you've got to learn to screen share because when you share your PowerPoints or you share a video or you share some content from one of the publishers, everything you're doing is through the screen share. Other systems don't work like this. This system doesn't work like that. I don't need to screen share to show you a presentation. So the technologies are actually different. The essence of Zoom is screen sharing. 
Now, the problem that we have as teachers, and I'm always trying to, to I'm always fighting when I'm working with companies, uh, software development companies, technological companies, is that they made Zoom. And they didn't just think about teachers, they're also thinking about businesses and they're also thinking about video conferencing, meetings, blah, blah, blah. So often these technologies get too big and they have too many different components. So though Zoom is very good, it is tricky because it has a lot of settings. And unfortunately, to become effective with using one of these technologies and feel confident, you do have to go through a process of kind of using the technology and getting your head around how it works. Now, the videos that I've done for you are really, and I'll give you them at the end, they really will help you to do that, okay? Because I go through, look, this is an important setting, this is an important setting, this one doesn't matter, this one doesn't matter. And I'm trying to show you what is important. For example, you have to set the breakout rooms before you use Zoom if you want to put the students into breakout rooms, okay? You have to give the students screen share. Otherwise, when they go into a breakout room, they've got nothing to share. So there are certain things that you've got to learn, okay? Unfortunately, and it includes for me, you know, these tools are tricky because the technology companies, and it drives me crazy, always make them more and more complicated because they're trying to sell them to education, they're trying to sell them to business, etc. So it is unfortunate that this is tricky. But if you get on the other side, you're going to have two worlds. You'll be able to teach online, you'll be able to go back to your face to face, you might open up a new world to you. So take it as a challenge because these are technologies that will be with us. And I do believe that uh, though you will never get me saying that you can that that fa uh, online is as good as face to face. No, I'd much rather be in a, a classroom with my students. I like the technology outside of the class for the homework. I don't like it in the class. I like being with my students and working in pairs and groups. But I do think that in the future, if you've got both of those skills, it could be useful to you. So take it as a challenge. We'll all get through it together. Um, and don't forget, these technologies are difficult, even for someone like myself, who's got a background in multimedia and educational technology. Though I'm not very tech, no, no, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a natural. I tend to have to work really hard to learn them. When we're thinking about teaching online, okay, and I've been running many courses for many years, basically, there's just two things. Something for the virtual lesson, so something for the live class like we're using now, and then some kind of platform that you're linking to where the students can do their homework. So that could be Edmodel, it could be Schoolology, it could be Moodle, it could be It's Learning, it could be the publisher's platform. Because that seems to me a really good connection. So don't listen to all this stuff that you hear. I mean, I have people emailing me saying, can we use Kahoot? I said, what would Kahoot is just a little technology. There's not a platform for delivering online learning. There's a lot of confusion about these technologies. You need a virtual classroom like Zoom and you need a platform for organizing your learning. That is it. Okay, I run huge courses on master's degree programs, 20, 30 students. We have a course at the moment uh, that I'll tell you about at the end with two and a half thousand teachers working through it. We use two technologies, a platform for delivering the live sessions and then um, uh, something for, for kind of organizing the students. You need two things. So in the videos that I made from Macmillan, I showed you Edmodo and, um, and Zoom because Zoom will do the live lesson, then where do the students do the homework? Where do they do the quizzes? How do they communicate with you? How do they discuss things with their friends? How can you organize them in groups after? That is the platform. Those are the two things you need. Virtual classroom, virtual learning environment. And I really would encourage you with whatever publishing book you are using, in any publisher you're using, to see what their publishing platform offers. Because I think that could be really good. Students work with you in the virtual classroom. Afterwards, they go onto the student onto the publisher's platform and they use the content. All right. So, one thing as well. I made this mistake in the morning. And I'm going to do the same here as I did. Sorry, hang on a minute. Made a mistake. That sorry, just come back. Made the same mistake in the morning. Let me just come to this. All right. Uh, this one I actually got wrong, and I mean to put here Padlet. When we're working with these tools, okay. When we're working with the core. So we've said that there is a core, these two technologies that you need in the middle. What you need to understand is when you start to understand that, 
you need to look and say, OK, I've got my live lesson and I've got the homework and activities afterwards. Is there anything else that I can use to complement? So forget all the teeny little apps that you can find on the Internet that you might use for one lesson because they're not really going to help you. But there are one or two or three technologies that you could link to using uh, your core, your platform and your and your virtual learning classroom. That's the core. There are a few more technologies that you could think about that really work well and they work well because you can use them many, many times. So, for example, Padlet is a brilliant technology and you can really link it to an online class. And I made some videos this week to show teachers. And I noticed that one of them has already been played 2000 times in 24 hours, just showing teachers how you can use these technologies in a classroom, in a lesson or for the homework. And they can take pressure off you because you can you can be doing a class and you can say to the students, right, click on the link and go on the Padlet and do the discussion, the brainstorming, put your ideas for a few minutes. The teacher can relax and you can wait for the teachers to do that activity and then bring it back into the classroom. So these activities that take away so much pressure on you are really, really important. OK, in terms of allowing you to not always be teaching all the time. OK, I'm going to show you a couple in a minute of the ones that I use. All right. Padlet is really, really improved. You can also set it so that it moderates. So if you if you're worried about what the students are going to write, put it in moderate. And then when the Padlet is created, you just have to click on it and just say yes, yes, yes. And then everything appears. Padlet is free. You can have, I think, free Padlets at any one time. It's great for brainstorming. Google Forms is another t technology that really complements. I did a lesson the other day with about 500 teachers and I got them to go on a Google Form so I could just relax. They answered all the questions and then we brought that back in and we opened it up into Zoom. We can do things to take the pressure off us and make the lessons a bit more engaging. I'm going to show you a couple of ideas. All right. Hopefully you're going to like this um, just to show you what I mean. And what I want you to think about is how we could use this technology, for example, with our students. One one thing to remember, if I just move on one screen, one thing for to remember, this is really important if you're going to use Zoom. Obviously, you can do activities where you open something onto the screen and you get the students to engage with it. What would be even more interesting is if you get the students to open something onto the screen and then they can engage with it. So now you're not in the lesson. So they share their screen. They show a PowerPoint presentation. They open up a website. And once they've learned to do that in a classroom, so that's here in this kind of situation, then you can get them to do the same thing in breakout rooms. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. For example, we could do this. Let me just see if I can just quickly show you. So I'm going to come over to my screen share. I'm going to share my screen. OK, and I'm going to just take you to visit a couple of websites that I really like. We're going to start with Google Earth. This is Google Earth. Google Earth is a tech, just a simple website that your students can go to. OK, and I always start by presenting, first of all, uh, as as the teacher. And what I'm going to do, here's the Earth. This is the start. So this is Google Earth. I'm going to take you on a little visit and I'm going to do a presentation. And normally what I would do at the presentation is at the end, I would have some questions that I would get the students to answer or I would put them into breakout rooms and get them to discuss. But then for homework, I would ask them to prepare something very similar. So I've got a little one for you. I'm just going to come here and I'm going to write in at the top here the name of my football stadium, my favourite football club, which is Chelsea. Uh, I've got my uh, Chelsea Cup with me here. They play at Stamford Bridge. So let's all zoom off to quickly, quickly have a look at Stamford Bridge. So off we fly. I just write the name of the place. It's that simple. Now, here we are, Stamford Bridge. I'm just going to tell you a, a few things about Stamford Bridge. You can see we can zoom around. We can even come in closer, OK, and look around it. And we can even uh, go 2D and look on top. Or we can go 3D and look to the side. Uh, I first went to Stamford Bridge uh, in 1972. I was seven years old. And I went to see Chelsea for the first time play Leeds United. And when I went there, they were building this stand. 
So actually, it wasn't open. Only three sides of the stadium were open. It was completely different. And there were 55,000 people in the stadium. My uh, ticket, my seat for Chelsea is here. I sit here. I'm a, I'm a season ticket holder. And Chelsea was created as a football club in 1905. Uh, it's owned by Raymond Abramovich. And Chelsea is actually situated in Fulham. Now, if I just take you down for a little visit, I'm just going to take you onto the road. So I'm just going to put my little man on here and just take you right down. So here you can see where is the entrance to Chelsea when I go to a football match. And so literally I come in here. I normally buy my program first and then my t I walk around the side here and that is my entrance into the stadium. OK, I'll stop sharing for a minute. We'll come back in a minute and look at that. But I'm just going to just come back onto the screen. OK, so hopefully open up my presentation again. Now, that technology, I could do a presentation and then I could now give the students some questions to answer, maybe put them in breakout rooms, get them to discuss. The questions might be what happened in 905? What does 55,000 mean? What is Stamford Bridge? Where is Stamford Bridge? When did Russell first go to the football match? How old was he? What was the score, etc.? Very simple questions. But then what I can do is get the students for homework to say, OK, I'm going to choose a place, a monument. I'm going to prepare a presentation and then in the lesson, your students can share the screen and they can present a place. Now, you can take your students anywhere. OK, when you use this technology, though, make sure your students haven't got their webcams on. This particular technology is a bit technologically, it's a bit heavy on the Internet. So don't have the students all having their webcams on. Webcams take up a lot of power. So if you're using Zoom, my advice is let the students have the webcams at the beginning, but turn the webcams off. OK, because otherwise you're going to have it's going to slow it down. You know, just to take you back to that technology really quickly. OK, so let's just quickly go back there. You know, you can take somebody literally anywhere when you're working with this technology. So let me just kind of bring you back again. Let's just take another example because I'm an English man. Let's let's just zoom off to, to Big Ben. This is very near. So we just fly off the Big Ben. OK, here we are around Big Ben and I could present Big Ben. I could present literally any monument or place around the world. It's not perfect, Google Earth. Some places are more modeled than others. But I love the fact that you can get the students to do a little presentation. And I've done this. I actually did this in Italy and got people to kind of present either their favorite football stadium or a famous monument or a famous place they like. And I could do the same here now. I could say, right, this is Big Ben. This is actually called the Queen Elizabeth Tower. This is the Big Ben the Bell. This is Westminster Pier. Uh, over here, we can see the London Eye. Uh, we can see here, for example, that this is Westminster Palace. Um, and this is what we call um, Parliament Square. And this is Westminster Abbey. Let's have a quick look at the London Eye. Let's go down there and have a quick look. I'm going to just drop right down here. Off we go. Zoom down to the London Eye. OK, I might have gone too far now. Just turn around. There it is. Oh, where it is. There it is. Sorry. Where is the London Eye? I've missed it. Oh, there it is. OK, let's see if we can get a bit nearer to London Eye. So I can zoom off almost anywhere. I've done this with Versailles. I've done this with my holiday in uh, Thailand. Uh, you know, I've done it even with really local places like where I used to go to the beach when I lived in Spain in Matalas Canas. You can use this for all sorts of things. So it's a really nice technology. Now, that particular one is a little bit is a little bit technological heavy okay so you've got to get your students to turn off the webcams but that's not the only technology that we can use that can do that kind of thing i'm going to give you videos for this at the end i'm using something called google earth but you know we do a presentation but then we get our students to prepare something and now they can do that either the whole class or in breakout rooms they could go in a breakout room, open Google Earth and present something in English. It might be really simple. This is London. This is Big Ben. This is Westminster Bridge. This is the Houses of Parliament. It might be very basic level. It doesn't have to be super high level. Obviously, if you've got stronger students, pet level, uh, upper intermediate, you know, B, B1, B2, you can get them to do more. 
Okay, but you can see how you can make your lessons a bit more interesting. And also, you can take pressure off your side. You can pass these over to the students, okay? That's the sort of thing I'm talking about. I'm going to show you one more idea. I'll keep this quick because I know you want to ask me questions, okay? And I've got videos on these ideas, but just to show you a couple of things. Let's come back to screen sharing. This technology, for example, is even is also really good. And this particular one I'm going to show you now does not require a really fast connection. I'm going to go to Google Maps. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to write the name of the school I used to go to. So I'm just going to click on that. And I'm going to take me onto the school. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to go right down here. The entrance is about here. So I'm going to drop on. Off we go. There it is. Lovely. So if I come around here, in fact, that field there was where I used to play football. Uh, that actually isn't a school field anymore, but that used to be the school field. And that was actually where we play football. But here is the school. It's called Stanford Middle School. That is it there. That was my classroom uh, from the age of uh, uh, nine. No, yeah, nine to 13. I went to that school. I was a terrible student. Mr. Humphreys was the headmaster of the school. I was a really bad student. I really didn't study that hard at all. I was quite problematic. Um, this is my route home. This is how I used to walk home. It was a long way. Children these days don't do this. But in the old days, you know, we would walk quite a long way home. All the way down here, I would be going. OK, this is Stamford Road. I would walk this all on my own, even at sort of like eight, nine years old. And incredibly, we come to the bottom of the road here. This is Rowan Road School. This is actually the, the school where my first girlfriend went, my first big love, Debbie D, we used to call her. I'm still in contact with her, actually, vaguely, even now. So even some of my friends from those days at primary school, I'm still in contact with them. Now, my house is actually even further, even further along. I've still got a long way to walk. It was about a 25-minute walk to go home, OK? Now... The same thing. I could take you to my school. I could take you to my house. I could take you to, you know, local places I used to go where I used to play football. I could present to you anything and not this technology. Again, it's not perfect in every country, so it's not always possible to use it. But it is a great set technology that you can use. It's not internet. It's not internet heavy. You can use this and get your students. Again, you do a presentation and then they can do a presentation. So it's good kind of way of getting your students uh, or doing an activity that kind of takes the pressure off off of you and gets the students doing a bit of speaking. OK, so that's for the virtual classroom. Your trick in really important is to do activities that you then get your students to do as a group. So let's imagine you might get one or two students now to open up the Google Earth or Google Maps and present something. And then another one might practice. And now you say, now I'm going to put you in breakout rooms and you can all spend some time doing the activity. Breakout rooms is when you divide them into small groups. In Zoom or in Adobe Connect, for example, you can put students into breakout rooms. When you put people into breakout rooms, remember, in the settings, you need to set turn on breakout rooms. And you must, before you start the breakout room, allow the students to screen share. Now, it's in the videos that I'm going to give you at the end. You, you can learn that, OK? So it's just a couple of ideas. You've got to think of ways of getting the students to take more pressure off them. And this can be particularly if you get the students to do some preparation work at home. So it's almost like a flipped classroom. Can they do something at home that can then allow them to take over the lesson a little bit? They present a picture and talk about their family or they present a PowerPoint slide or they talk about they open up the screen and take you to where they went on a, ho a holiday or where they went camping or where their grandfather lives. It, it can be lots of things. Or I do my favorite football stadium. I always do that when I'm working with young with young learners. So you've got to think about the po possibilities. But those two tools can br can personalize the learning a lot and they can make you do activities that will, might take a bit of the pressure off you. Now, at the moment, then, a lot of the ideas around how can we make the lessons more less teacher centered and how can we bring the platform into the lesson? How can we what, get students to watch something at home or watch a video and do an activity and then bring that into the class? OK, or do activities in the lesson 
where we are not involved for a few minutes and they watch a video and have a discussion or they go to Google Earth or they go to Google um, Maps. They do an active or they go to Padlet. And I, I put two videos in yesterday to give you some examples of exactly how you can do that. OK, and I've seen some examples myself where I've been watching teachers of how they're learning slowly to take the pressure off themselves. All right. If you follow my work and if you sign up to my newsletter, then you'll see all these videos that I'm putting up. As I said, one of my videos has already been played a quarter of a million times. Uh, the next videos that will be coming out will be about assessment and feedback and some more videos about the technologies that we can use. What I did was I made a special handout. Now, if you email me, you will get this handout and it gives you access to videos about Zoom access to videos about Edmodel and also we are running a free course on how to teach online that's a collaboration between teacher training videos and Nile Norwich Institute of Language Education and the, the, the collaboration in the collaboration um, there are now I think something like 2,500 teachers doing that course and we teach you how to use Zoom in quite a lot of detail and how to use Edmodo and we also show you some of these other tools like Padlet and that course for now is free so please take advantage of it so if you email me teachertrainingvideos at gmail.com do it now or do it later automatically you will get that handout and that handout will give you some help videos for Zoom uh, particularly look at the ones about breakout rooms and screen sharing, some help videos about Edmodel. Edmodel is a great way of organizing your students, though also the platform that Macmillan provide could be a, also a really good idea. And there's also a link if you want to sign up and do the free course that we're running with Neil, that Nile, which is really popular. It's doing really well. OK, it kind of takes you through how to build an online course. And it gives you a bit of theory. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I've actually got a few meetings at the moment next week because I do collaboration with universities and I'm working with a couple of schools and then we're all thinking about that. So we're actually going to have an online discussion. One of the there's two things that I'm thinking at the moment or two or three things. The first thing is the possibility of students recording themselves. So the, the possibility of students recording themselves doing a presentation and setting Sending that in. That is one possibility for the assessment of the oral. It depends how big your classes are. You could get the students to do that in pairs. That could be done in Zoom. OK, so there are technologies like Screencast-O-Matic, and I've used these a lot with my students, where the students can open up a PowerPoint slide and they can turn on the recorder and record themselves and then share that with the teacher. So that's one thing. We're also looking at, again, another reason why the platforms can be so useful is that these platforms, when the students log on to them <coughs> and do the activities, the teacher can see what the students have done. So if you're looking for summative assessment of your students, you can be setting activities for the students to do in the evening after a lesson in Zoom or a lesson in whatever live platform you use. And you've got information about whether they got, got it wrong or got it right, what questions they're having problems with, etc. So make use of the platform. It's another reason why I am saying that I think this is the moment for the platforms. These platforms, in reality, most of the publishing companies would admit that really the teachers haven't been using them that much up until now. My belief is that those platforms are going to be really important now. And so uh, Loom is another one that you could do the recordings of, yes. OK, lovely to see lots of your ideas going in the screen here. I can't keep up with them all, all right? But yeah, that would be definitely part of it. And then my thing is e-portfolios. The thing that I've been talking about for a long time, and again, something that could become more important now is the ability for students to do pieces of work and put them into an e-portfolio. And that is the evidence of their learning. That could be recordings, that could be audio, that could be writing, that could be discussions, that could be written work. You could get a student to build an e-portfolio. Now, I've done this a lot. I'm going to be honest. I've done it mainly with teachers. But when I was at Westminster University I and Warwick, I did e-portfolios with my students. And my students were not young. I'm not necessarily saying that you're going to be able to do this with young learners. So there are some of the things that we're thinking about. Students recording themselves, audio or video, using the assessment tools that are provided by the publishing companies, and e-portfolios could be part of that. Okay. Thank you. And there is a question 
uh, that I managed to pin up to the chat box and it says, can right. we have different classes going on simultaneously in a single Zoom meeting? No, I think that would be really hard. Uh, you can, you also, you as a teacher, you can, you can organize as many Zoom classes as you want, but you can only ever have one class active. Okay, so you can you can prepare 20 classes, but you can only ever have one class active when you're working in Zoom and you can put your students into breakout rooms. But to have two lessons going on simultaneously, no. And on the same account, that's not possible. If you've got two teachers, they would both need an account each. Okay, because you can have 50 classes ready, but you can only have one active. You can't have two classes active on one account. Uh, I think it, I've never, ever tried to teach two classes at the same time i think that would be really really difficult i mean yeah even in real life i think yeah, that would be amazing yeah. uh, there was another question that is really pragmatical and it was pragmatic sorry and it was uh, what would you use padlet for uh, for example an activity that you would use padlet for brilliant yeah i mean look i would never show you a technology and if you follow my work, you'll realize I'm really against all these silly little apps because there are way too many teachers. Oh, this app, that app, they do one thing. Padlet is brilliant. You go on, you create a Padlet. It's an electronic corkboard. So you create a Padlet, you share the link, the students can click on it and they can add up their ideas. So quickly you can get together brainstorming. It can be brainstorming for vocabulary. It can be opinions. It can be their ideas. It can be a question about something specific. What did you do at the weekend? They can, in the Padlet, they can put up not just question, not just um, text, but they can put up pictures. They can put up video. They can put up links. But Padlet doesn't only allow you to do electronic court board. You can use it for a timeline. So there is a Padlet timeline. So then you can make a history, the history of a famous person, the his your history, the history of a member of your family. Now, then the students could open their Padlet in the class, in the virtual classroom, and then talk about it. OK, I was born in 1990, uh, blah, 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 blah. So they could do that. Or you know, they could talk about someone fa famous, Benjamin Franklin, blah, blah, blah. And they just give a short history. So that's just another thing. There are other possibilities. In a Padlet, you can put a map. And then you can put different things on that map. So again, you could then present that to the students. What we're trying to do is link what the students do outside of the class with what they do in the class. This way, the teacher's not always teaching. The teacher's listening. If I ask the students to go home and produce a Padlet where they take a map of where they recently went on holiday or a place that they visited in the last year or so, and they mark a few places, and then I get them to open up their Padlet on the screen and talk about it. And then maybe I'll get another student to do the same. And then I say, right, now I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. Share your ideas with the rest of the class. And then maybe the, get them back afterwards and we report back and find out, okay, tell me what, what Maria said. Tell me what, yeah, so we can do these activities. But it means linking what you do in the class with, or what you do at home with what you do in the class, not just doing a virtual classroom. Padlet and Google Forms. Google Forms, for example, when I did the lesson the other day, I had a big class of teachers. I just created a Google Form and the teachers, I clicked on it and they answered the questions. I was relaxed. I could drink my, I could drink my cup of tea from my Chelsea mug for a couple of minutes. Then I could open it back on the screen and the students, I could say to the teachers, right, let's look at the information. And then I could say, if they were students, I could say, right, OK, give me some sentences about what we found out. For example, maybe I make a survey about what students do in their free time or how they try to study English. So then it might say, so the students might look at all the data because when, all, when they answer the questionnaire in Google Forms, all of that information comes back to you instantly and it's all created in graphs. So the students can say 30% of the people in the class never read an English book. 20% of the people in the class have an English friend. 5% of the students sometimes watch television English. You can do lots of activities where you actually work with the data. Or they could write something. We could send them off to then do a writing activity. We could send them off and get them to do a summary on an interactive whiteboard. There are loads of things we can do. But we've got to start thinking about linking what we do outside of the class with what we do in the class, not just teaching a virtual classroom. And I'm saying this because I've been watching classes the last couple of weeks. And at the moment, that is what a lot of teachers do. 
So try to think, have a bigger vision. Remember I said that at the beginning, a bit of a bigger vision. I think teachers are doing brilliant. At the beginning, I had no choice but to learn Zoom because everyone was told, right, we've got to start teaching. But now we need to just start thinking, okay, this is, you know, this is too much work for me. Can I make the lesson a little bit more student-centered, all right? Yeah, thank you. And indeed, there was a question about um, how to, what tools would you use to let students collaborate between them, even without you as a teacher intervening all the time? Yeah, well, I mean, when you work with a tool like Zoom, you can actually set it from the beginning that they have an interactive whiteboard. So you can say students have interactive whiteboards. So when they go into the breakout room, they can open up an interactive whiteboard and they can all write on it. They can all draw on it, etc. So immediately they as soon as they you've taught them to screen share, they can screen share anything. They can go off onto the Internet. They can go on to Google Earth. They can go onto Google Forms. But the interactive whiteboard is a really good place to collaborate because instantly the whiteboard is there and you can just go. And you can obviously when you when, when students go into breakout rooms in Zoom, you can go in and you can see what they've done. OK, so you can jump into a class and then don't forget when they come back. You can say to one member of the group, OK, show me what you've done. Present it to the rest of the class. So this whole idea of linking and playing around with getting the students to do something, bringing it back to the class, getting to do the students to do something at home, bringing it into the lesson. Not always you just teaching all the time. It's not easy. I think teachers are doing a brilliant job. And with a bit of practice, you'll do it just like the way you do pair work and group work and, and set homework that you link to the lessons. Slowly, you'll do the same thing when working with Zoom. Thank you. And there was a really uh, a couple of really interesting questions from Mary asking uh, what about privacy and GDPR and, you know, all of these copyright um, laws that, for example, do they allow you to link to YouTube or to show content or to even show students faces when they're underage, for example? You know, how do you approach all of the legal side of it? Um, the answer to all those questions I can't really give because some of that will be to do with the sort of logistics in each country and within a school as well. I mean, you have to remember that as far as as far as we're concerned, when we're in a Zoom class, we're in a virtual classroom. Now, you may need to think about whether or not if you're going to plan on recording the lessons, therefore you may insist that the students turn off their webcams, you would have to check with your school about what their policy is. But as far as the webcams being on when the lesson's on, well, that's exactly the same as being in a classroom, isn't it? But I don't, it might be slightly different if you decide to record the class. Now, as far as GDPR is concerned with, I mean, number one, you know, we have to understand that these are very special circumstances. Your students, when they log into your um, Zoom session, do not need to put their emails in. OK, I know you do on this system that we're using today because you had to register. But when you use Zoom, for example, you create a link and the students click, click on that link and they just write in a name and they come into the room. So it's not necessary, if I remember rightly, for them to even add an email address. But obviously, under the circumstances, you know, the we're going to have to be a little bit open. And what I mean, for example, is the publishing companies have been very generous when it comes to, for example, making use of the interactive whiteboard in a lesson. OK, so you're obviously opening up content, but that's just like doing it in a class. It might be a different issue if you record and put that onto PowerPoint, onto onto YouTube, then you're making it public. Then there might be an issue. So be careful when it comes to recording content, a lesson. But as far as the lesson's concerned, there's no problem. Now, as far as you using YouTube or anything from the Internet, that's fine. Uh, if anything's been shared on the internet, that's there for public consumption. You're simply using it in a the class. There's no problem at all. My only issue that I can see that is important is to think about is to think about if you decided to record the class, okay? Whether or not, therefore, you're going to allow your students to have their webcams on. And one thing I must emphasize to you: if you get your students to run their webcams, and I've already seen this many times, the lesson can fall down. The webcam takes up a lot of the internet, so be careful. My thing is, let the students turn the, their webcams on at the beginning. They're going to make lots of noise and talk and shout. When you start the lesson, turn the webcams off because you need to get, get control of the lesson. And you have to explain to them, right, we're going to do some activities now. There's no need for the webcam now. And also, if I have the webcam on, it's going to slow the internet down. So keep that in mind. It's one of the most inter internet-heavy features of using one of these systems is the webcam itself. 
Thank you. So there was um, a question indeed about how to keep students um, entertained and, and focused uh, when you're online. So, you know, you can't walk through desks and similars. Yeah, I mean, this is what I'm saying about, in a way, the activities that we need to do. And, to, you know, that was why I was kind of showing you Google Maps and Google Earth. And we need to look, you know, it might, it, we're going to need to think in a different way now about the types of activities that we're going to create, especially the personalization, especially making use of the Internet. I know with young learners, I was watching some classes the other day and the teacher had the students, you know, had lots of things ready for the lesson. So they had to hold up different things onto the camera and drawing up drawing up pictures and they were all jumping around all over the place we're going to have to think of another way of working we're going to have to bring in the some of the good things about the fact they're at home with all their clothes and their toys and stuff which can be a really good thing and also the fact now that the internet we can bring the internet to life i'm not pleased one thing you know make you will never get me telling you that a class you know online is as good as being in the classroom i'd rather be in the classroom any day I like technology outside of the class. Where I think we have all missed out so far is not looking enough at how we can blend our learning. I would never have wanted this situation to happen. What I would have liked to have seen a long time ago is teachers taking more interest in how they could get their students to do more homework on, on outside of the class and get them making use of Quizlet and get them making use of YouTube and getting them to use the, the platform for the learning. But, you know, you can't beat the classroom. But we're, we're teachers, we're creative, we'll come up with ideas, we'll share ideas. You know, I've showed you a few today. I've seen other ideas. And slowly we will build up now a whole new pool of activities and games because it could be even doing some gaming on, 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 on online as well. I've even seen a few kind of things like that happening already. Um, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but we can do it. Thank you. That's really encouraging. And I think a lot of us need to hear that. There was a question by Mohammed, which is pinned up at the top of the chat box. Right. And he asks, um, should we be committed to pacing guide and the course book? So when teaching online, is it the same time spent in real classes? And also, um, you know, a few questions popped up about how to relate to the course book when you're not in an actual physical classroom. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously, I, 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 it's a very, I think that's going to have to be something you're going to have to discuss with your school in terms of the pace of the classes and whether you're going to change that. So I've had, I'll give you an example, because I actually work with a lot, of, well, not a lot, I would be exaggerating. I've got about three kind of agreements or contracts consultancies with schools, uh, school in Portugal, school in Spain, school in Italy, helping them. And for example, today we were talking about the fact that with really young learners, you can't do an hour. Uh, an hour just seems too much. They get bored. They get distracted. So that means we can't get through the book as much as possible. And this is why, do you remember I said to you at the beginning about student autonomy? We are going to have to think very carefully about what the students are going to do when they're not in a class with us. And we're going to be needed to be connected through some kind of system where we can email each other and connect with each other. And it may mean that we have to kind of do less live teaching and maybe a little bit more homework. And it may mean that we're not going to go at the same speed. OK, as far as the book is concerned, and this is really interesting because I study Polish online and I have my book. And um, often with my teacher, we'll do an activity where she says, right, do the reading. And I'm, just for a couple of minutes, I'm quiet. And I'm doing the reading, then I come back into the lesson. And, you know, you can do that online. It doesn't have to be that it's always, always the teacher completely, you know, working all the time. You can do that. Now, because you have the interactive whiteboard software or you have the platform with the book, sometimes when you want the students to do an exercise that you would normally ask them to do the exercise in the book, if it's possible, say to them, right, do the exercise online. Because then you can open the platform in screen share and you can see if they've done it. Because the platform will track the activities the students do. But don't be fret, don't be scared to use the course book. I love course books. All right. I, I, in, my, in my Polish classes, I have a course book. I like working with a course book because it connects everything together. But don't be afraid. And my teacher will often do it. Say, right, OK, Russell, 
read that text or Russell do that exercise and then, then report back to me afterwards. Right, let's go through the exercise. Why not? That, that is a possibility, okay? You don't, you've got to do anything that's going to take the focus off you. So getting the students to go off and do some writing, work in breakout rooms, do things on Padlet, do things on Google Forms, do things with the course book, do things on the platform. That, so you're not always teaching and plan your lessons like that. Thank you. There is um, a more subjective question. Uh, I think you really got us with WD. So people want to know, um, Jorge, I really hope I pronounced your name right, wants to know what have you found the most difficult about teaching online? Well, I mean, the, the, there's no, well, I think a little bit what I'm saying, Jorge, it's a lovely question. I do think that it's that, look, I think that you're going to be brilliant. You guys are going to, you're going to get there. You have been put in a situation when everyone's been thrown Zoom or Adobe Connect or something, one of these tools, and you're just going to have to get your head around it. And they're not easy to learn. I told you why at the beginning. Now, I think the hardest thing about online is at the, at the beginning, you focus and everyone is focused on teaching in the virtual classroom and no one's seeing the bigger picture. So at the moment, that's where the focus is. So the, the, the focus, the, the hardest thing about teaching online is that learning of ways and techniques to take it away from you and make it over to the teacher, over to the students. And I think over time, you will learn it. You'll see the content on the platform. You'll think about these technologies that you can link. You'll learn about Padlet. You'll learn about the platform. You'll learn about Google Earth. You'll learn about Google Maps. You'll learn about Google Docs. And you'll bring in more things bit by bit. You can't do it all. OK, you know, this this took me time. We're all thrown into another situation. I think one thing I would really say to you, I mean, I don't know about your situation and your country, but, you know, this could last. So we could be talking about doing things that actually are going to really be useful for a long time because it may really be quite a long period. For example, I'm doing some work at universities in England and we're thinking that maybe this could be kind of in terms of the students that might last right up till Christmas time. That not to necessarily say that, that, that no one will be leaving and going out, but they might say to themselves, look, just to make it easy, we're going to make the first time online the first term online. So there are possibilities that some countries or some institutions will make those sort of decisions. We don't know, do we? We, don't, we haven't got a clue. But I'm just saying to you that get, learn these things because it's going to be useful skills and it will be useful skills when you go back to a normal lesson as well. You'll suddenly know what Padlet is. You'll suddenly know what Google Forms is. You'll be able to bring in the platform. These platforms, the one like that the Macmillan's devised, uh, you know, they're great. They offer loads of activities, extra activities. You can see what the students have done. You can track their score. You can go into individual reports. If we learn to use these platforms, when we go back to teaching in the normal context, it's going to add to our teaching. Yeah, indeed, there was Sarah asking if you thought that um, summer schools could be done online as well. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I have to, I mean, obviously I've got no idea. I'm only talking about a, a meeting that I've already had with some, some, some universities, okay? I've got no idea what's going to happen at, the, at, at school level, or in other countries. I'm just talking about the UK, okay? For certain courses, they're saying, look, you know, even if students are not going to come back uh, in September, they're going to want more time. People will be scared. Excuse me. Different countries will have different policies. So, excuse me. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, sorry about that. So, so you know, um, I think, you know, it could happen, couldn't it? We, it could. We, it's good if we're prepared. It's good if we're prepared. So I think just push on. Learn as much as you can. Look, li listen, one thing I, I want to say to you. I always have this this thing, right? People say, oh, yeah, but Russell, you're good with technology, okay? No, I'm not good with technology. I don't even really like technology. I don't have loads of technology in my life. I don't have, I don't even have things like Twitter and Facebook on my telephone. I don't care. I don't care. I just was a teacher that loved doing my classes and being in the lesson and getting the students to do pair work and group work and running around and using all the creative stuff. And sometimes I looked at technologies and I thought, wow, if I could get my students to collaborate or if I could get my students to make more use of YouTube or if I could get my students to use Quizlet, I can help them. So all the decisions I made about technology were driven by what I thought would help them in their learning. I'm not pro technology. I'm 55. I'm not a natural with technology at all. So I think, you know, 
uh, what I'm saying is if you push on and you get just like me, you push through and you learn to use these technologies, even though it's not you're not naturally good at them, it's going to put you in a brilliant situation because you're going to be a teacher who can use technology or not use technology. And then when you come into my classes, you'll see, Russell, you don't use a lot of technology in the class. No, I don't need to. I've got my class students running around doing pair work, doing group work. But what is brilliant is if I can get them to go home and study on Quizlet when they're on the bus or on the train or go home and walk around listening to a YouTube video and learning English through it or connecting with a friend in English or doing exercises to support what they do with me in the class. That's when technology is great. And this could open up a world to us. It could make us all better teachers. Thank you. And quite a few people were asking about um, how to deal with younger learners. So young children, how do you entertain them? How do you um, deal with them uh, when you have to teach from a distance online? Right. So listen, I've got to be honest. OK, my age groups have been from about eight years old upwards. And I taught in that kind of situation from eight and right up to adults from 1987 when I first worked in Crete until I left uh, from Spain in 1999. So that was 12 years. And then I taught university students English for about another five years. So a long career, but I've never taught young learners. So I don't know a lot about teaching young learners. But what I will say is this, from the other teachers I I'm talking to, first of all, again, we've got to be really imaginative. So we've got to think about the camera. We've got to think about, so this time we do need the camera when we're working with young learners. We've got to think about what they've got around them. So can they bring things in to the room? They're sitting there. Some really young learners, you might have to think about whether the parents should be there. Okay. And you've got to try and make it as physical as, and as visual as possible. Okay. Not easy to do. From what I'm getting from a lot of the teachers I'm talking to, they're saying that a 50 minute lesson or a 60 minute lesson is too long that you're going to have to make the lessons shorter. It may mean more lessons, shorter time, or it may mean shorter lessons and get the students to do more activities. Or again, stopping the lesson, getting them to do some coloring, getting them to do some drawing, get them to hold it up on the screen. But you may have to find ways of, again, moving away from this very, very heavy teacher fronted lesson. You know, lots of visuals, touch your nose, do this, stand up, run around, hold this up, draw this, lots of activities like that. Lots of things of bringing things onto the screen, talking about them, drawing on the screen. You can give, when you work with Zoom, for example, you can allow the students to annotate. But my feeling is, from what I understand, is 30 minutes maximum. So you may have to think about more lessons, but, but, but um, shorter. Thank you. Indeed, a few people were saying that um, probably the best approach to online teaching is to shorten all of the classes, regardless on of the student's age. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that might be the case. And this is comes back to some of the points. I mean, this is brilliant. All the points you're bringing up. Think about what I was saying at the beginning there when I just quickly went through some of those points. And I was saying to you, student autonomy. Do you remember I put that in there? That's what I'm saying. We may have to get, you know, it's there. All right. We've got to teach our students to become better learners than on their own. We've got to help them to develop the skills, make use of Quizlet, make use of the platform. Our job sometimes might be to introduce these technologies. I do a lot of work on that in the class with my students, teaching them things that I'm not going to do in the class, but I want them to do at home. How to use Quizlet, how to listen to a video on YouTube. You know, how I can get them to act. I show them different content that they can access. And we practice in the class, but we do that so that they can then do it in their free time. Even keeping a little diary of what they do as autonomous learners. I put enormous pressure on, in, on my students, or not pressure, but I, I do a lot of focus on trying to help them to be good learners outside of the class. I mean, even me in Polish, I do things like record myself speaking Polish. OK, so I think that is one of the things that's going to happen. It might mean a little bit less from the teacher and more from the student. It's going to mean, you know, we talk about autonomy. We've been talking about it for 30 years. Uh, maybe now we've really got to try and help our students to become more autonomous. It's not easy, but I think it's something we've got to go. Thank you. And I'd say we have time for one last question, which I think will close nicely uh, without a hint of hope. Um, and it was, do you think that online teaching has got even just one feature that makes it better uh, than live teaching? 
or you know wow, one thing what, wow. is better with online teaching <laughs> brilliant questions absolutely brilliant questions yes yes because look learning like i was a terrible student at school I'm absolutely terrible student. You know, I became a better and better and better learner. I was not even a good language learner. I did not have a single language qualification when I left and went to university. I couldn't speak French. I couldn't speak Spanish. I couldn't speak any Chinese. I couldn't speak any Polish. And now I can speak two of those languages really well and two of them just a little bit. How did I learn that? Because I learned to become a better learner. We have got to help. We've got to focus more on trying to help our students to learn. And that will be us helping them. We've all learned to speak English. And we sometimes we do too much teaching and not enough transferring of the knowledge that we've got. I know if I walk around for two hours a day or one hour a day listening to Polish conversations and studying maybe seven, eight words of vocabulary and doing my quizlets and getting up every morning and doing a bit of homework, that my Polish will get better. And I don't need my teacher to do that. And I often have my teacher and I feel guilty because I've not been working hard and I know I'm not going to perform well in the class. To learn a language really doesn't have much to do with the teacher at all. You only see the students two, two times. A my teacher didn't teach me to speak Polish. OK, what, what, what made me speak Polish was that I did loads and loads of homework and I tried to make as, as much many opportunities to learn the language as I can. You don't learn a language in the classroom. You learn a language of all the homework you do and all the activities you do outside of meeting friends and going to the country and watching the television and trying to read a paper and making use of readers. I love readers. I, I, in Polish, I have about, I went to Poland a little while ago and did a course. The first thing I did was buy a pile of readers in Polish. So I do think it has, because I do think that that aspect of trying to put a bit more responsibility on the students and maybe us changing a bit and helping them more to study and not thinking so much about the teaching, but how we can facilitate them to become better learners, being more reflective, learning to evaluate how they're doing, I evaluate, you know, I look at my post and say, oh, Russell, come on, you've not been doing well. Study more this. Oh, look, I've got problems with this. All those types of skills we can help out. And that is, that is forced on us by the online teaching context. So, yes, that could be a really big benefit. Thank you. I think that was a great note uh, on which to end this session. And you also received an invitation. I don't know if you saw that, but you received an invitation to go to Poland and practice uh -huh. your language when all of this is over. So well done. <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you. I, um, you know, I'm just going to say one really quick thing just to, yeah. to, to remind because I said it at the, at the end of the last one and you said to me, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I've revealed to you how old I am. I first started teaching in 1987 on the island of Crete. And you imagine what would have happened if we'd have had coronavirus then. There would have been no internet. There would have been no extra materials. The st I would have had no contact with my students before. I would have not been able to do anything. I would have told them to do the exercises in Streamline Departures or Headway, whatever book I was using at the time. You know, this is a different world. It's not as good. Don't ever get me telling you that being in the class or te te you know, learning online is as good as, as being in the classroom. No, but this is a different world. We can help them a little bit and we will do the best we can because we're a really creative community. And I know that teachers already are really making a huge effort. So just don't forget that, you know, this is a special moment. And 20, 30 years ago, this wouldn't have been possible. We would have hardly been able to do anything for our students. Okay, good luck, guys.